There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Look at my new book quilt. <laughs> Isn't it gorgeous? I can't show you the full thing, but it's huge. And uh, I just got it yesterday. This is a belated, totally unexpected wedding present from one of our family's dearest friends, Laura. She made it. She made it specially for me because she knows what a book person I am. I absolutely adore it. Just got it yesterday. She gave it to my mom. She's been, she's been making it since my wedding five years ago. <laughs> Most kids and I... Celebrated. I didn't mention that on the channel. Kenji and I celebrated. Celebrated? Did we celebrate? We didn't really celebrate, but we we had a five-year wedding anniversary a couple weeks ago. <sighs> Apart. Look at this. I just am in love with it. Laura. Her name is Laura. She and her husband, Don, had kids around the same age as me and my sister. And I grew up with them and grew up with those kids. Laura is a, a virtuosic musician, p pianist. The whole family is just incredibly musically gifted. They could have been another Osmond family or something. Uh, they were that talented, if not more so. And she was my music teacher, my piano teacher. And <laughs> I took piano lessons for about 100 years and uh, never was any good. And she finally... <laughs> acknowledged that when I saw her a couple years ago, around five years ago. She said, yeah, I guess I could admit now. You really didn't have any musical talent. And I knew that all along. But she hasn't been to karaoke with me because I, my vocal talents are <laughs> better. A little bit. My acumen is a pianist. And she's got talent coming out the wazoo, so she made this quilt. She makes placemats and she does all this stuff. And she's had a lot of health issues that have been very concerning and preoccupying over these years. And she made... This beautiful, beautiful quilt for me. So thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. That's how I wanted to begin today's Friday Reads. Hello, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. And here I am with the Friday Reads. I'm tired today. I'm still not sleeping well. I still have lots of minor health issues that are interfering with a good night's sleep. So if I look um, like death warmed over, just remember that I have a beautiful quilt. <laughs> That's the... That's your aesthetic stimulus for this video. I do have books to talk about and nothing else, really. So let's go directly to The Week in Review. Yeah, Manain, I think, is an interesting writer for him to have written about because he is weirdly divisive. I mean, it's Australia, I don't know how unusual this is, but it is very much a country that, simultaneously loves it when Australians are famous or popular overseas, but is deeply suspicious of people who are popular, that they seem to be getting away with something. And that's coupled with the fact in Manane's case that he is a, I think, quite unusual person for a successful writer in terms of the way he writes and lives. Here I am with my TBR for a brand new readathon debuting on Booktube in September called... Straya September, hosted by the wonderful Scott of Gunpowder Fiction and Plot, and he explained Straya, and it kind of went over my head, but it has to do with drinking copious amounts of alcohol, some prime minister or something. Uh, the copious consumption of alcohol I was all in favor of, plus I'm very keen on Australian literature, so here we are. All right, and I have not finished much this year, this year. I have not finished much this week. I've finished one, and I have a few books to tell you about that are in progress, and then, of course, I'll tell you what I'm planning to start. The book that I finished, and I'm not going to say very much about it, because it's going to be featured as part of a, a discussion video uh, fairly shortly. This Western Canadian novella, The True Story of Ida Johnson by Sharon Reese, as I showed you before, I have a signed copy. It was originally published in 1976. It's kind of a, a minor classic, I guess you would say. The reason I reread it is because Barb Howard, the Calgary novelist, and I have been discussing novellas, and this was one of the ones that she put forth as one of her favorites. And so 
I reread it to have a discussion with her about some of her favorite novellas, and she's reading some of mine, and we're going to have a that follow-up discussion in the coming days. So that's why we read it, and that's all I'm going to say about my reaction. Stay tuned. I talked a little bit about my preliminary reaction last week, and I'm not going to add any more subjective comments. But there are two blurbs on it, and I usually think blurbs are just propaganda. I don't pay any attention to them. I think that they are. Authors are pressured by the publishers to give them, so very few of them have any authenticity whatsoever. But with that cynicism in mind, let's listen to the two the, by two preeminent Canadian writers. The first one is Atwood, and these would have been given at the time that it was originally published back in the mid-70s. This is an exciting new writer with a sure grasp of the vernacular, complemented by a quirky sleight of hand. The effect is magic realism, a flat-footed waitress caught in the eerie light of The Last Judgment. And uh, uh, other reviewers and readers of this book have taken issue with her calling it magical realism, but whatever. She was a, a fan of Sharon Reese's debut work of fiction. And the other one is from Marion Engel, who is one of my favorite writers. And I have an ongoing series of discussion videos with a bunch of literary types uh, annually to discuss uh, work by Marion Engel. She's been dead since about 1980, I think. So this is her blurb. It's the stories of the ordinary persons in any culture that make its backbone. Ida is important because her life is more typical of most Canadian women's than, say, mine. The novel is important in another way. Its technique is stunning. This is a fine, fine book. Well, I will give a little bit of a spoiler in agreeing very deeply with that last comment of Marion Engels that its technique is stunning. So, stay tuned for more of my thoughts in the upcoming chat with Barb Howard. I'm going to check in on four books that I've read enough of that I have a sense of what I'm thinking and feeling about it. So, th let's get to those four. And one of them, Gwen, if you're watching and you don't want to hear any of my preliminary reaction, you should skip ahead or turn it off. <laughs> because this is a, a buddy read with my dear friend Gwen, who lives in Saskatoon. This is the New Zealand novel, Loop Tracks, by Sue Orr. Published a couple years ago, 2021. And a very popular novel within New Zealand and really hard to get anywhere else. But my friend Gwen was in New Zealand, and I suggested she pick herself up a copy after I stupidly <laughs> paid to buy it from New Zealand and get it shipped. It cost three times as much to get it shipped to me as the book cost, but I wanted it that badly. I had a bite-sized book chat about it. I'll put a link to that in the show notes, and I just had to have it. And, and Gwen got her copy, and now we're buddy reading it. We're not doing, you know, we're going to talk about it after we both finished it. And I'm a little bit behind, so I'm going to finish this sucker in the next week or so, I think. I'm not going to complain anymore about how much I spent to get this book, because it, based on this much of it, it was worth every penny. This is a really, really fine novel. I'm completely engrossed in it. I'm not going to say very much even about the opening chapter. It opens with the protagonist, as I think she's 17, and she is pregnant, and at this time, 1970-what... 1976, abortion is banned in New Zealand. So if you want an abortion, you got to fly to Sydney, Australia. And so her parents put her on a plane. They are mortified, embarrassed, ashamed, but they want her to have the abortion. And she does too. And then there's plane trouble and plot ensues. And I'm not going to say any more than that, even though it's very early in the book. You can find other reviews, including, I'm pretty sure, the review by my interlocutor on Bite Size Book Chats. She says more than I'm going to say here. So if you're as sensitive to spoilers as I am, you don't want to watch that bite-sized chat until you've uh, gotten the book in your hands. I have now found that it's available in the West, like in the West. It's now available in North America, at least. I'm pretty sure in the UK and Europe as well, in ebook affordably. So that's another option on Amazon or whatever. I'm so glad I have the physical book. It's a beautiful book with heavy paper. The next part of the story jumps ahead from 1978 to decades and decades later. Let's see. 2019. So quite close to the present in New Zealand and the same protagonist is now a grandmother and she is raising, she has raised 
her grandson, who I'm not sure if he has an autism diagnosis, but he certainly seems like he's on the spectrum of autism, and he's now about 18, and she's done a seemingly a really good job of raising him, and she is all consumed by his welfare, and he gets a girlfriend in the opening pages of the second part of the story, and that's all quite endearing, and seeing how the protagonist, the female protagonist's personality has changed from being a 17-year-old to being a, what would it be? I don't know. I can't do the math, but she's a grandmother age, maybe a young grandmother. And uh, her intellectual what preoccupations, she's really into linguistics and she teaches special ed, I think, to young children. She's got a brilliant mind and she's a very caring woman and she's got this very stressful burden in a sense but also joy of of look, of raising her grandson and he's a fascinating character his new girlfriend is fascinating and the, the idea of what the loop tracks mean it has something to do with the music and there's weird fascinating stuff brilliantly described about all of that as well as a whole bunch of linguistic things that get mixed up into it the writing is gorgeous the characters are memorable. I am very, very enthusiastic about how this is starting out so far. I've read a hundred pages. I'm a little behind on my buddy read with Sonia of an enthusiastic reader, but we started our buddy read of Edna O'Brien's next novel. We're reading her novels in chronological order, A Pagan Place. And this is, what was the year again? 1970. I love this. So, Sonia, if you don't want to hear my reaction, because I'm late. We were supposed to check in yesterday on the first half, and I'm about 50 pages, I think, away from being half done. And I told her I just probably didn't even have the oomph to read those last 50 pages tonight after I do my Friday reads. And so it'll be tomorrow before I check in, a couple days late. But the good news is, this is delightful. This is as Irish of a story so far as the Country Girls trilogy, or the, the volume one of the Country Girls trilogy. My prediction is I'm going to end up loving this as much as I loved Country Girls, the first of the Country Girls trilogy. Is it Country Girl or Country Girls? Her memoir was called Country Girl. The trilogy is called Country Girls. So the first volume of that was her most Irish novel, I, don't, I would say not having thought about it for more than a minute or two, but this one is very, very Irish and a wacky family that reminds me of the family that the protagonist of the Country Girls novel grew up in. And the writing is gorgeous. This is a really meandering narrative, so you really have to pay attention or not pay attention and just let it wash over you, but there's just... It's almost like free association between one character and one incident to the next. And it's just incredibly meandering. I'm enjoying it so much. The writing and the quirkiness of this young female protagonist. She's a girl for almost all of the story so far. And her wacky, really at times malevolent parents and the neighbors and the hired men. It's weird. Wacky, wonderful, it's vintage Edna O'Brien. I am smitten so far. I'm on track with my uh, new buddy read with Joe Smith, and that is this 1947 British novel, I believe it's 1947. Betty Miller's On the Side of the Angels. I don't really care who Jonathan Miller is, but apparently he's famous, but I would say he should be mostly known for being Betty Miller's son. She died in 1965, aged quite young, 55. She was born in County Cork to Jewish, Lithuanian, and Swedish parents, which just sounds incredibly fascinating. I didn't opt to read the introduction by her son. Joe read it, or read at least part of it, and said that her life was incredibly fascinating. I went directly to the novel, have read the first two chapters, and checked in with Joe on those, and this is really beautifully written. I think this is her only novel, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Oh, I guess it was first published in 1945, so it right at the end of the war, and it's about two sisters, both of whom are in relationships. Honor is married to a soldier, and her sister Claudia is engaged to another soldier, and they live close together in the UK. Their partners have not been stationed overseas. It's right at the end of the war, 
and the setting, which is Linfield. I didn't look up where that is, but that is, don't know if that's a real place, but it's certainly very vividly described, including the the military barracks or the re, the residence for all the soldiers. But these guys live with their wives off site, and there's a whole bunch of tension about how much time their commanding officer thinks they should be devoting to their family life and how much they should be devoting to the unit and all kinds of stuff about that that's really tense, vividly described. And the relationship between the sisters has lots of conflict as well as lots of loyalty and other emotions uh, vibrating back and forth. Also told in a very nuanced way. I'm enjoying it. I'm not sure if by the end I might not think that some parts were just a little bit overwritten, but I haven't read enough to think that. It's certainly highbrow prose, and that's usually my thing. So, so far, I am a big fan. And this is one of the Capuchin Classics editions. I have one other one, and they're out of long out of print. I want to collect them all because this is, so far is two for two, and I think they're just very attractive. I don't know what happened to Capuchin, but they are no more. I think I'm... It's safe to say they published a whole bunch of good books, and I need to have them all on my shelf and in my RAD folder eventually. And the last one that I've gotten a ways into is this Inuit novel, which I'm reading for Women in Translation Month, library copy, Sanak, by Mitjerjik Napaluk. And it's doubly translated, so it is translated from Iniptitut to French by Bernard Saladin Dangleur, and then translated from French to English by Peter Frost. And I'm doing this as an audio text combo because one of my uh, viewers uh, alerted me to the fact that there's a great audiobook, and I agree, it is great, and I'm would I'm, I'm getting so much more out of it, listening to it, because all, there's a lot of inept words in here. There's a glossary at the back, but to hear all the names perfectly pronounced, it's enhancing my experience of the novel. Am I enjoying it? I don't know. Maybe it's it's very matter-of-fact story, but it's certainly interesting. So I'm enjoying it because it's interesting rather than that it doesn't have so far the the full-bodiedness of a of a novel. It's more of and then they and then they did this and then they said this, but the lifestyle of almost pre-contact Inuit life the evil white people have just shown up for the first time in their lives, and so I, that's going to um, screw things up royally. But their way of life is so fascinating that that matter-of-fact description is holding my interest, and that's my preliminary report. I'm as interested in to learn more about Mitya Napoluk's life as I am to experience this novel, because she was incredible. As I said before, this is the first novel ever written in Inuktitut syllabics, she has compiled an encyclopedia in Inuktitut language of Inuit traditional knowledge and a whole bunch of other things. She died in 2007. I want to know a whole bunch more about her. And this is a very unique reading experience thus far. I'm going to start three books because they are I have various commitments to uh, <laughs> to keep up with. So one of them is... The third novella that Barb Howard recommended, I didn't think I was going to read it. It's a very sports-minded novella, translated from the Dutch. I'm not sure how you pronounce his surname. Tim Crabbe, or Crabbe's The Rider, which is about cycling, translated from the Dutch by Sam Garrett. Yeah, I I think I, I will enjoy it. I am not don't care about sports at all, or the athletic life. I mean, look at me. <laughs> But anyway, that's what it's about, and uh, Barb raved about it, so why not read it? It'll take me a, probably a week to read it, and we'll talk about it. And I'm much more excited, to be honest, to dive into this one. I have to read half of it by Monday, so I've got my reading cut out for me, because the amount of other things that I've got to read this weekend... <laughs> uh, life is beautiful. Uh, this is a... what is it? I believe it's a memoir or a, a memoir in essays or something like that. It's a nonfiction book by a deaf author who lives in Saskatchewan. I think he lives in Regina. Where does he live? He lives in Saskatoon. Oh my God, I didn't know. I didn't remember that. He lives in my city. Adam Pottle, voice. 
on writing with deafness. And I stumbled upon this when I was browsing the stacks at the University of Saskatchewan Library. I was aware of him and was just about to start or had just started reading True Biz and signed this out. And then I told Heidi about it and she said, yeah, let's buddy read it immediately after. So we're going to do this over two weeks and check in on the first half on Monday. That pairing, I think, is going to work really well. I'm certainly hoping it will, because uh, I have all kinds of questions about how true to life and perhaps how narrow or broad the portrait of deaf life, deaf culture, and uh, deaf politics was in the world of that novel, compared to I'm now looking to expand it from with some nonfiction voices about the deaf experience, and I'm hoping this will be a great way into all that. And finally, I am so lazy and tired this morning that I'm not going to get up and check, but I'm going to read a gay novel that was on the book spin from Litzy this month. And the author is Jim Grimsley, and it's not The Wings of the Dove, because I know that's Henry James, and you would never catch me reading any trash by that awful writer. Um, but it's something dove. <sighs> the man and the, the boy and the dove were... The Soft Feathers of the Dove or something. Here's the cover gif. And I'm going to get started on that. Um, I take these book spin month by month things very loosely. I'm getting it started on the very last few days of the month. But I have never read anything by the um, gay American novelist Jim Grimsley. It's on my Kindle. And so I'm going to finally lose my Jim Grimsley virginity. <laughs> And hopefully have the title in my head by this time next week. So that's the kind of reading week it's been. It's actually been a really good reading week. I wish I was feeling a bit better, but I'm not going to go on and on about that. I don't want you all worried. It's all mild. It's just persistent. Can't shake it. So in the meantime, happy reading, everyone. One and all. Thanks for watching.